You are listening to KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank, your partner in possible. What's going on? Welcome back to Radio Row here at the 2023 NFL Scouting Combine. And BJ Kissel joined by a couple special guests with 10 year NFL linebacker Sean Barber, who spent time with Washington, Kansas City, Philly, uh, Houston, been around a little bit, and obviously former Richmond Spider. And we've got a special guest uh, for this episode with. Uh, Chiefs defensive line coach Joe Collin, also a Richmond Spider. You guys have a history, so I want to let you guys kind of go back down uh, memory lane a little bit uh, here before we get things started, obviously talking about here at the Combine and with, right. so with the Chiefs. All right, I'll shoot it over to Coach, man. And at, honestly, there's just a, a, a man a, a flood of different emotions and images, but the one that keeps going on in my mind is me sitting on a bench press, lifting, maxing out 315, and then you running over there and giving me a bear hug and knocking me over the bench on my butt and just saying how we got to get after it and just preparing each and every offseason just for a massacre out on the field. I know the energy, the excitement. Our, our D-line is just, man, they're just, they're just budding at the seams um, to be coached up by you. What is it like, you know, I guess going back to the Richmond days, uh, just kind of take us up how we kind of got to know each other and, and what that means to you. Well, first of all, B.J. Sean, great to be on. Wow, that does bring me back a few years and kind of uh, some great memories. Yes, sir. And Sean's referring to my first job responsibility at, at a younger age was defensive line coach slash strength coach. Part of the deal at Richmond, we had to get a lot stronger, so we had our maxes going on at that time. He may be exaggerating, but I did get a little excited when, when he hit a personal best, and uh, obviously that stuff carries over onto the field, but we had, a, we had great Great uh, memories from Richmond. Uh, Coach Reed came in, took over the program. Uh, I was with him. Uh, we took a four and twenty nine program our first year. Uh, I think that was Sean's sophomore year. We won eight games, and we stumbled a little bit, but then got back to being top top two defense. I think his senior year in uh, one double A at the time, FCS now, and Sean had a great career. Was a uh, Obviously, a 10-year veteran in the NFL, but he's an All-American at Richmond. He's a defensive back, I believe, from Herman and Chiesa. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we and we made him a Sam linebacker in uh, 13 sacks. I mean, All-American. Just uh, offenses had to run the other way. And when they did, he usually ran those guys down. But, you know, it's great to be part of a great historical franchise in Kansas City Chiefs and having Sean being part of it. His son works in our organization. Sean played for the Chiefs, uh, and obviously our great run this year, winning another Super Bowl. It's just great to be here, reminiscent. You tend to undersell yourself because I know you're an All-American. The other night he said you ran like a four-seven, and like you ran like a four-four, and he was like my bro- my vert was like thirty-five, and vert was like thirty-seven and a half. Like normally it goes the other way. Well, I've learned in life if you undersell yourself and then show it on the field, show them show them what you can do versus trying to uh, build yourself up to be something great, um, that's probably the best way to go. And I think when I stepped on the field at Richmond, I didn't really know much football. Football was, it was sec- it didn't come second nature to me. I know I was athletic, but it was your defensive mastermind. We put together this spider defense that was like no other, no other team in the nation was doing it. And we were bringing um, athletes from all over the area, all different sides, all different angles. Thank you, sir. All right. That's what you get radio row right here. We got the Colts mascot. Hey, who cares if we're taping the show? Just let's throw in some some good merchandise. <laughs> Straight from Indy. Thank you, thank you. Kisses and hugs. We all about love and family and football and faith here. But going back to what we were discussing, um, having the chance to be a part of a defense that was um, a little bit ahead of its time. I mean, using players outside of positions. I know we took all of our corners and made them safeties. We took the safeties, made them linebackers like myself. Uh, linebackers made them defensive ends. And then we bumped the defensive ends, we de- defensive tackles, in order to bring more speed to the defense. How does that relate to kind of what we're doing with Kansas City and stuff now? Well, I think when you, when you, when you look back, obviously Coach Speck knows, but oh yeah, Vass is good a defensive coordinator that has been in the league. I mean, he's the only – only coordinator won a Super Bowl with two different franchises. Now he's just won his third uh, with the Giants and then and then the Chiefs. But going back, so really the history of that defense started when Coach Reed 
was at Boston College, Dan Henning, three-time NFL head coach. We're talking about Jim Reed, not Jim, Andy Reed. Yeah, but. that's Jim Reed, not to get mistaken with Andy Reed. Yes. felt the same. Two great, two phenomenal coaches. So Coach Reed was sent out to Minnesota, and Dan Henning said, I want to put Tony Dungy get-off defense in. So we went out to Minnesota. Some guys on that defensive staff were Coach Dungy was a coordinator. Monty Kiffin was a linebacker coach and, and a great mentor of mine, a guy named John Terling, God rest his soul, was the D-line coach, and they were historically good on defense. Mm. They led the NFL not only in sacks, but also in run defense. And then we kind of implemented that after Coach did it at Boston College, and they had a top five defense, 55 sacks, if I'm not mistaken. We took that to Richmond, and by the time Sean was a senior in an 11-game season, we had 60 sacks. Yes, sir. And he led the charge. We had other players on that defense that played a long time in the NFL, Paris Lennon, Mark and Magna, Mark, Magna yeah. just to name a few. And then those are the three catalysts that really spearheaded that defense. But the thing was about getting speed on the field. And we took, you know, maybe a step slow corner made him a safety. Maybe a step slow safety who was a little bigger made him a linebacker. You know, an outside linebacker or a defensive end made him tackle him. That's, that's where we got more speed on the field. A lot of teams do that in the NFL as well. Coach, you, like a lot of coaches that have been tenured, that have been in the league for a long time, that go to a lot of different places. There are a lot of different stops, uh, different stops in college, different spot st- stops in the NFL. But for you, going to your time at Richmond, is there anything that you can specifically say that you took away from that time that you still use today um, that helps you in your coaching or what lessons you learned during that stretch of time uh, that still help you today? Oh, yes. I mean, that was the foundation. Yeah. I mean, the foundation was we were led by, a, in our eyes, Sean, myself, I worked for Coach Reed, played for him. He recruited me, and I worked for him for nine years, a legendary coach. He's way ahead of his time in terms of the work ethic. He just outworked people. Yes. We were going to practice hard. We were going to be a physical football team. Uh, and, th- and that was, to this day, I mean, you know, you talk about, the Kansas City Chiefs talking about they throw the ball all the time, but we are a physical football team, and that comes from the top. That comes from Coach Reed and how physical we have a training camp. I think I mentioned that uh, last week. And then also from you know, Coach Spagnola and what, what our defense is built on, our foundation. Even being physical, the way we practice, how hard we practice, that all that stuff carries over. How you treat players, mm-hmm. and Coach Reed had a unique way, Jim Reed and obviously Andy Reed, unique way of pushing people to be their best yet players knowing that they love them like like members of their own family we we've joked uh on kcsn obviously we just met obviously you guys have history uh that you were the the best free agent pickup that you had <laughs> last year because of what you were able to get in your entire staff i'm sure you're wired the same way that everybody that i had been around on that team and that it's not about you it's about all of you guys coming together to do the right things you have a fun group there in the defensive line room you have some personalities to work with before you took the job uh, with the Chiefs and got a chance to get to know those guys from the outside looking in, what was the most intriguing thing about that group and coming to work with Spags uh, and getting a chance to be around those players? Well, go, going back, so talk, talking a lot about our days at Richmond, who we worked for, Coach Spagnuolo's first coaching job was with Jim Reed at the University of Massachusetts. He's a graduate assistant, and, and, he, and he worked under Coach Reed then. And having the opportunity, I've known Coach Spagnuolo a long time, just to finally have the opportunity to work under him and learn from him. And then in the defensive line room itself, I loved Chris Jones coming out of Mississippi State, Frank Clark coming out of Michigan, the opportunity to get around those guys uh, and to get get to a championship caliber football team was really enticing. And having the opportunity to learn from Andy. With well, some of the concepts that I remember back in the day that uh, I know are, are staples in your coaching is understanding what a hot LZ is, knowing how to get your piss hot, and know how to treat the field like it was on fire. Nobody ever, first of all, you don't get knocked down, and if you happen to get knocked down off your feet, you better be back up on it within a half a second and chasing the ball relentlessly, relentlessly like your life depended on it. There, there's not many coaches that can voice and create that type of motivation through just coaching. They want to put their hands on you. But you, you have a way and a technique of motivating guys with your, your tone, your voice, 
you find different ways to get them to want it way worse or, or, or than, I, than I've seen them in the past. Well, first of all, I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't think they can understand me, number one, my, my Boston accent. But I think we've always tried to sell the guys, especially up front. You're only as good as the men up front. And they're the leaders of the football team. Yes. <laughs> and both sides, same with Coach Hector. But there's one thing that we try to do, and that's to lead the NFL in effort. Those are things in our room that we said, okay, well, what can we do that takes no talent? We can lead the NFL in effort. And that goes way back to leading the nation in effort when we were at Richmond yes. or wherever I had been. And those are some of the staples that I learned from some great mentors, Rod Marinelli, Jim Reed, mm. John Carling, that come, come hell and high water now, you better be going as hard as you can. And if you need a, if you need a blow, I'll give you one. But you, you got to go as hard as you can because great things are going to happen. We have a saying. You never know when your sack is going to come. I can promise you this. If you're not going hard, it's never going to come. Yes. A lot of times that happens at the, the tail end of the, of the, of the down. You're covering good. Maybe the play is extended. Those are things that I think you look at our guys this year that we tried to do. You mentioned Colin Saunders. Mm -hmm. Colin, I thought it was about three quarters of the year, maybe, maybe in the last quarter leading up, I think it was after we played, uh, Seattle. So we're getting ready to play. Right in Christmas, yeah. The Christmas time. He said, how do you think we are in terms of the NFL effort? I said, well, our group, where our defense is playing, I think we're right there, but we could take it to the next level. And then, and then Colin was one of those guys that I thought made a ton of plays on effort alone. You look in the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. when, he, when he chased out mm -hmm. Jalen yes. and knocked him out of bounds, it was a minus one. That's a sack. Yeah. I know if Colin's just lollygagging or saying, that's not my play, no sack there. Jalen may be turning up the sideline for a first down, but those are some of the things, Sean, I think that have to be instilled every day. And when, when, when I first got in the NFL, look, I said to Rod Marinelli, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that runs around, yells, you know, do I have to calm down because I'm in the NFL? He said, hell no, that's why. I <laughs> so I think it's just being yourself and, and pushing yes. guys to be the best. Yes. One of the things that we saw at training camp, uh, we went out there early on uh, with Frank Clark coming back and just kind of his ability and his willingness after practice to say, we saw it with George Karloftis when, you know, we kind of, as a outsiders looking in, got to see that access of him working with those guys. What throughout the year impressed you most about Frank? You talk about him coming out of Michigan, a player that you like when you get a chance to be around him every day and what he meant to some of those younger guys. Uh, what was, what stood out to you about what he did? Well, first, I love Frank, 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 if I, if I could say in one word, some of Frankie's relentless. He has a reckless abandon for his body. This goes 100 miles an hour all the time. And you saw that just pick up throughout the year. Yeah. Um, Frank came in training camp and talked over the summer and then through the offseason. He said, Coach, when I come back, I'm going to be in great shape. I promise you that. Coach, when I come back, we're coming back to win a championship. Mm. And, mm. and so he came back in training camp and you witnessed that, BJ. I mean, we had to run right in to watch the tape and I'd look, Frank and Chris. Frank would be out there. I'm going up the hill and turn around. He's working with yeah. the guys, working with George, which doesn't really happen. He's a first round pick. Sometimes older guys are like, oh, is he here to take my job? But Frank, Frank didn't care. He was trying to get George the best that he could to get ready to, to get to the level we were at and ultimately win the Super Bowl. And then Chris was doing the same thing. And when your two best players are taking the young guys and working them after practice, not only in training camp, but throughout the year, and, and mentoring those guys, it was a great thing. And, uh, you know, Frank, Frank, like I said, he came back in great shape, and, he, and I thought he had a, had a heck of a year. The, the NFL and teams are full of talented players. But to get the best guys on your team to have enough trust and then communicate their skills and abilities to the younger players to get them to play on a higher level. From a coach's standpoint, to get those guys to believe in your system, in you enough, to have faith and trust in the team concept to realize when, when we all get better, I, I've done my job. It's not just about me going out here and putting on the cape and getting a sack or getting three sacks. It's all about developing our unit to stop the run, chase the quarterback, sack the quarterback, and then at the end of the game, we're going to win the game. We're not going to be on the sideline waiting for the offense to score because we gave – no, when we have the opportunity to close the door and win the ball game, we do that on the defense side of the ball. Not every coaching staff and not every team has enough mental toughness, courage, 
is the term we used at Richmond. Having enough courage to go out every day and practice that way. Right? That's the way you earn it. You earn it on the practice field. Because everybody wants it on Sunday. Everybody wants it on game day. But having that determination to go out there and work on the off season and work on your body and work on everything you need to do to be the greatest player you can be and pull up the young guys around you is what made our your your defensive room a very special group. Well, I think it goes back, Sean, I know you're very passionate in your voice explaining that. Like I know me as a player, you know, I was fullback linebacker, go to UMass, they give me a ninety seven, I gotta go to nose tackle, I was quit <laughs> under side five ten, two fifty, but that's the only way I knew how to play or to make a difference. And then, you know, when I got into coaching, some of the great coaches that I had coached every day, like when they came off the field, they were drenched, they were, I mean, they couldn't talk, mm -hmm. but, you know, pushing players to be the best. And then there's a great fighter at that time, Mike Tyson, I was college in the mid to late eighties, won his first championship. And he had a saying, you can't live soft and fight tough. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and I love baseball, when a, when a great hitter goes in the bat cage, they come out drenched. They don't go in there bunting and placing and then come out. They, 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 they're taking that bat and they're swinging as hard as they can. Yeah. Well, pass rush or a defensive lineman, everything goes hand in hand. It's combat with your hands, your feet, placement. You have to do that at a fast and a high intensity level to get it right on Sunday. If it's not right there, you're not going to go out on Sunday or Saturday in college to do it right. I think when the guys buy into that and it's going to help them play better and then and help the defense play better and maybe it gets contagious, things they see results and they buy it. Right, well, let's transfer to the future. I mean, what, 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 what do we see here in the Indy at the Combine? I mean, we saw some of the fastest freakish athletes <laughs> on the earth go out and run these forties. We uh, a defensive end ran four four four. Nolan Smith, God, four three nine, four three nine officially. As a defensive coach, I've been around the game as long as you have. Like, what do you think about the way that athletes have just changed over even the last like ten or fifteen years? Have you noticed in the way that you scheme and the way that you just come out to these these kinds of drills? And now there's so much specific exercises and just it information out there to get these guys to go out there and perform at levels that we haven't seen in some of this testing. Well, I think I think it goes back and we had another guy named Mark Beck that was a couple, a couple of months muscle and fit, this great player, trains Chris in the offseason, yeah. like and down in Miami. Anatomy. Anatomy Jim. Shout out to Mark Megna in Florida. Yeah. So I think I think what happened is guys always train, but now you have so much more in terms of the sports performance at their colleges, at, at the professional level, their private trainers, the access they have to to recovery, with, with mm. all the frozen chamber, I mean, you name yeah. it, all the <laughs> stuff, the hot hot tub, cold tub, this this chamber, that chamber. Uh, the, the access wasn't there before, and the, and the way they train, I think uh, they take care of their bodies and they recover faster. I just think it's off the charts. And I think that's enabling players maximize their potential maybe at a younger age. Now, we've seen, obviously we saw that multiple guys seemed like they had the best years of their career. Mike Dana stepped up and seemed like he developed and started making a lot of plays. We saw Colin Saunders, Chris Jones having the best year of his career. What what intrigues you or what excites you most about the group you have? Knowing there's going to be turnover every year, it's going to be a little bit different, but for the core group of guys you have that you know they're coming back, what excites you, excites you most about getting you to work with that group every day again? Well, I think when you, when you look at Mike, for example, I played a little bit. He got thrown in the f Turk. Wharton got hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Mike had to go inside and rush on a consistent basis. He did. And then just the, the way we rotated him, mean, he was really like a starter. I mean, I, I think if I, I made this statement that Mike's a Swiss Army knife, if you had a Mike mm -hmm. Dana, every position on the team had a Mike Dana, would be in great shape every year. I think he's going to take an even bigger step. The way Chris and George kind of like gelled together a little bit, they, they, they work out together, they hang out together. George really, Kaloftis really came on at the end of the year when I had seven and a half sacks for a rookie, one in the postseason. I think his best football is, is he's only scratched the surface. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to be getting Turk back. You know, I know he's had the injury there. A guy like Colin now is saying, okay, I've done it. Really, I'm a starter. I can go start in the NFL. Uh, 
I just think it adds it adds so much more to the room. And then obviously there's going to be new pieces every year. Is different. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm I'm excited. I think Chris 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 came back in phenomenal shape, and he just had a. And we talked about for us to win the Super Bowl, not just get to it or maybe fight for it, but to win the Super Bowl, he had to have a career year. Our group had to have a career year. Coaches had to have a career year, and I think that. I can say that about the linebackers, secondary, yeah, yeah. job that Brendan did, or Coach Merritt, and all those guys did uh, in the back end with all those rookies too. I want to ask about George specifically because we talked about it throughout the year that he started day. I mean, he was getting a lot of snaps in the very beginning of the year, and then late in the year started to pick up the sack numbers, started to pick up. And normally you'd see like a rookie wall or something like that, and it seemed like physically he pushed right through that, which. Is it something you would normally see for a rookie, let alone a rookie that was playing as many snaps right off the bat as he was? Well, the nice thing we had, like with Frank, Carlos Dunlap, directing those yeah. guys, Carlos had a great role, did a phenomenal job. He was a mentor as well in that, that room. Mike Dana, Malik Herring, you had, op, you had guys that could rotate with those young guys would not take all the snaps. I mean, George started, had some growing pains earlier. But really, we, we tried to keep him at a pitch count, you know, instead of playing 60 plays, maybe 35 a game where he could, you know, take care of his body, which he did really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, learned from some of the guys in the room. And uh, he very conscientious of that as well. But he just kept getting better and better. And right about Thanksgiving, when that wall usually hits, he he ran right through it. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, we talk about mindset and everything. And obviously, what takes – you chase that lion all the way up the mountain. And at the peak of that mountain is a championship. And now that you've got to the top of the mountain, we know the hardest thing in any sport is once you've already succeeded and you have been successful, and now everybody is looking at you as the champion, how do you go back and press reset and get the guys to buy in at the same level they did a year ago, knowing, like you say, hey, it's a brand new year, brand new team. Human nature is a little bit of a decline. Human nature makes you rest on your loyals a little bit because well we know we're going to be there we know we know this team is successful enough to be there at the end we can just wait until the end and turn it on and we'll be the chiefs come playoffs you got to convince those players that that has never been the way and i always say the process is greater than the product i i, I text coach all the time during the season uh hopefully not too much no, no, it's great. <laughs> but just little nuggets it. that just brings it back to the same thing the process how you prepare yourself, the process is so much greater than the product, even when the product is a championship. Well, I, that's a great point. And I've talked to guys that want to see all of them ever got back. Yes. And we've had the opportunity to get back, but got knocked down and won. So I think now, last year, we were hunting everybody. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now they'll be hunting us. Yeah. So we were the hunter last year. And as hard as we worked last year, like you said, you've reached the top. Now we're going to get everybody's best. And I think you didn't. We're going to get everybody's best no matter who we play, whether it's preseason. It doesn't matter. They they will be hunting us from day one to knock us off your help. And that's something that we want to defend. That's something that me as a coach, getting our guys to, to buy into even more. We have to do more. Yeah, how we did this. That's right. The last coach, we appreciate your time. The last question that I have, and it's kind of along those lines. Of I don't know, and, and granted, I don't know much different because Coach Reed's the only NFL coach I'd spent some time around, but he's always so good at eliminating the distractions and, and making things very simple to, to get everybody focused on the same thing. So some of the stuff you're talking about, if anybody can kind of get everybody in line and, and start that communication to to work towards that goal again, it could be Coach Reed. Somebody that I know the NFL world and the coaching is small, been around Coach, I'm sure you guys are familiar at some level, but being around him every day, what was the most, not surprising thing to you, but uh, what was the biggest takeaway that you have from from being around Andy Reid and all the success that he's had throughout his career, the relationships, the way that people talk about him? Uh, if going from the outside as somebody that went then worked with him every day, what um, was your biggest takeaway from being around Andy Reid every day? Well, you know, you talk about Coach Reid, Andy Reid, and this goes way back. My first college coach, Bob Stull, hired him in El Paso, yep. and then they went to Missouri. But so I've known of Coach and same 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 uh, friendships that we've had. But I will say this about Coach Reed, and this is why I know we're going to be staying on top. I've been in the NFL 16 years. I worked for John Harbaugh for five years at Disciple of Coach. I worked for Rod Marinelli, 
tough as they come. Probably the, the greatest defensive line coach, him and John Terrell, to come out of the NFL. But there's no tougher coach than Andy Reid. And he just keeps you on, on the focus, what's in front of you. But our training camp is we're going to make sure our team is ready. Sometimes when you're in this position, you've, you've heard of other teams say, we're not going to get more in her. We're going to do this or that and lighten up. Not, not in St. Joe's. So our, our training camp, he develops that mindset. He develops the, the physical toughness, the mental toughness, really, that I sets us apart from anybody else. Not a lot of wasted time at Chiefs training camp. No. There's always something going on. And when you mentioned Bob Stowe, one of my favorite, sorry, Sean, but one of my favorite yeah. things that I did when I was working at the Chiefs, I was able to tell a, a long form story on Coach Reed. I wrote about 15,000 words on Coach Reed and just his, basically how he connected to all the different coaches. He mentioned Bob Stowe and El Paso. Remember talking with Coach about Derek Cutter giving him the call after leaving Northern Arizona, where he's with Brad Childress, yeah. and I learned how they all connected back yeah. to Vic Rowan and everybody. But Derek Cutter calling him and Coach going to interview for that offensive line position, and Coach Stoll had the assistant strength coach take Coach Reed out to lunch at the diner in El Paso, and it was Dave Tobe. And I was like, can you imagine going back and uh, graduate assistant assist, assistant strength coach interviewing this offensive line coach, and then. 20 years later to see what those guys did throughout their career and, and talking to Dave Toe about how he went from strength coach at the University of Missouri to defensive line coach with the the tragic passing of the defensive line coach at that time. It's And not to go on another tangent, but Dave talking to Dave Tobe about making the tr- tr- transition to defensive line coach, him saying that Justin Smith made my entire career because he had him as a freshman at the University of Missouri when he got that D-line job and he goes, he made me look like I knew what I was doing before I got a chance to know what I was doing, but DJ, it's a small world. Like, so we we had great success at UMass. It was an opportunity. I was I was coaching the running backs to go to Missouri. I was in nineteen ninety one. Mm-hmm. Coach was the offensive line coach. Dirk was the offense coordinator. And he, Marty Martin, we was on that staff. Yeah. So my defensive line coach, Steve Killen, was on that. So gonna go, gonna go. Decide not to go because I got hired full time. Coach Stahl's like, you got to stay there. And then so. Turn the clock ahead about five years. Coach gets the Philadelphia job from Green Bay. Mm-hmm. And then Marty Mortonway gets the uh, Detroit job at a very young age. So the guy that was going to get me there, Mike Wood, God rest his soul, he passed, called me. He said, hey, Joey, he called me Joey. He was a graduate assistant. He met on the phone. He's like, remember Andy Reid, the guy I told you about, Marty Mortonway? Well, they're not head coaches in the NFL. You would have been known one of them. And <laughs> it's funny. I worked for Coach Reed and then Marty Mortonway. We worked together at Baltimore for a long time. So, oh, that's cool. That's cool how it all fits together. I'm, you got me, man. Hey, could we, we talk about trust, communication. Those are the things that, you know, the, the family atmosphere, um, the faith. I mean, those are things that I know Andy, in some form or fashion, has impacted this organization since day one, since he's got here. And any coach that I've been associated with in the past, any coach I've ever been, been able to have a longstanding communication with, the one thing I've told them over and over again is if you can make it to Kansas City, it's something special going on. And hopefully, as, as part of it, all our you know ex-friends, ex-coaches, they have an opportunity to, if not experience it with Andy, to experience it with somebody because it's so it's such a blessing to be able to coach young men and have them reach their potential when, when you're doing it the right way. Well, that's a great point. And again, going back to Andy Reid, Jim Reid, Yes. Great ones you've played for, Sean, over your years. They're genuine. Yes. Coach Reed is genuine, cares about people. He develops the man, and you can still do that in the NFL. He develops the man and then the player. And the great ones have been around. That's why he's special. Not everybody does that. Play, what can you do for me as a player? Out the door, bye-bye. Oh, hey, coach, you're not going to help me. You're gone. But he develops the man. And he does that in his coaches and his and his players. And there's been a few guys that have been around that had a special touch to do that, obviously, coaches. Yes, sir. All right. But last, I lied. We'll have one last question. <laughs> we'll bring it up about the combine. I'll get you off the hot seat. Bring it up about the combine because we talked about the rookie class last year. I think it was the fourth most snaps played in the entire NFL in the regular season by a rookie class for a team that went, obviously, and won the Super Bowl. Uh, obviously, Brett Veach and his staff are on top of things. Now that you come to the combine, only two weeks removed from the parade, uh, and winning a Super Bowl. You guys, the scouts have been looking at these guys, the coaches kind of playing catch up around this time. When you come here to the combine, what's your favorite part of this? And what are you kind of 
what's your main takeaway when you go watch these guys? You watch the different workouts, get a chance to sit down with them. What's the part that you enjoy the most? Well, I think getting back to Brett Beach, I mean, he, he does a phenomenal job. Great job, him and his staff, Mike Bogonzi, the guys on, on down, Tim Terry, all the guys. Yeah. They do a phenomenal job. But my favorite part is, you know, you have the formal interviews, you have the informal interviews, getting to know in a 15-minute time. It's hard to get to know the player, but you get a feel. And then you get a feel of maybe how they compete if they're doing the drills. Why aren't they compete? Mm. To me, it's about getting around the players as much as you can and getting a feel for them before you really, this is really when you start digging into everything. Maybe going to their schools, maybe following their pro days, all the way up to the draft. And uh, that's what I love about it, just just getting around the players as much as I can. And I'll close it this way. When I came out of the University of Richmond in 1998, Coach, you remember, I had eight pro dates. Yes. Because I was coming from such a small school, and we knew that the big, the big teams were going to the UVAs and the Virginia Techs. They weren't going to stop by Richmond. If they did, we had to be ready to just put together a pro date with, with, with the hour's notice. So every Tuesday and Thursday for the entire month, we had eight pro days at University of Richmond. <laughs> And I ran the 40s. I did the bit. I did everything eight different times to put together enough film because I wanted everybody to, like Coach said, I wanted them to feel me and know me and know there was nothing in me in my DNA that was ever scared to compete and put it right on the line in front of you each and every day you came by. So that it's surprising to hear that. That's a lot of pro days, but knowing you a little bit, it doesn't surprise no, me that you went out there and competed no. like that. Every time they, someone call, hey, I, I, I couldn't come last week. I remember that. Yep. They get the weight room ready. Sean's going to be. Go get the forty ready. Get the track ready. Yes, sir. And that was, and really, that was the, that was the first time. And Rich ran some professional players back in the day, but that era right there, Sean started it. Winston October. Winston October. Dwan Jaring Gang. Yeah. Dwan Jones. Yeah. Uh, near Moore. Yep. And near Moore. And then and then, Perhaps Perhaps Lennon, Yeah. They, it, it started that, and and really that that next year when Mark went, same thing. A lot of teams came back and. I think between him and Sean, they had 30 sacks between both of you for yeah. senior year. So that's amazing Pre- stuff. Appreciate you guys having me on. No, thank you so much. Again, that's Chief Defensive Line Coach Joe Cohen. Spent gracious with his time to hang out a little bit before he gets back and, and gets with the crew and tries to bring in the next group of players to try to hopefully uh, defend this Super Bowl and uh, continue winning games in the golden age of Chiefs football. We appreciate everybody for listening or watching. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching this production of KC Sports Network, the fastest growing sports media network in Kansas City. Check out these videos that feature our team of more than 15 former players, insiders, and analysts bringing you the best Chiefs coverage you can find. Entertain. Educate. Inform. KC Sports Network.